if each of you would just take 30 seconds to just tell us your name, what your latest book was, and what you've been doing the last 20 years, just so we can uh, get familiar with you, and then I'll start questions. Joanna, why don't you start, since we missed you in the video. Mm -hmm. My name is Joanna Malachinsky moore I'm the author of the book Silent Winter, Our Chemical World and Chronic Illness. Um, I have a background working in consumer products, and greening consumer products as an attorney, an entrepreneur, uh, activist, um, and writer now. Uh, I also worked as a consultant, and so I had a lot of experience dealing with industry and government and, you know, just issues from all sides. Um, but I became motivated to write this book when I really became ill myself. I was really getting ill over the decades, not really realizing what was going on. Um, and it became super obvious to me that my health was being impacted by the toxic chemicals in our environment. Uh, some of it had to do with choices I made about where I chose to swim and things that I decided to do and some things were out of my control. Um, and I was motivated, I was inspired by Rachel Carson's Silent Spring because she had started a short chapter about human health impacts that was 60 years ago. But now we have 60 years of evidence of how toxic chemicals are affecting our health. And that was my intention in writing that book. Thank you. Andre? Okay, my name is Andre Loy. I'm an organic farmer, a very long-term organic farmer, but I'm also the, the current international director of Regeneration International. We are the, the international global organization for promoting regenerative agriculture. I've also an author of three books. The first one is called The Myths of Safe Pesticides, where I just deconstruct the science that's, that that's put out to say that pesticides are safe and clearly show that there is no peer-reviewed science that shows that the pesticides that we're using at the moment are safe for people. The next book I wrote was to talk specifically about the dangers of small amounts of pesticides and other chemicals for children, particularly the fetus and young children. Once again, how there is no evidence-based science to show that any of these chemicals are safe and a lot of evidence-based science to show that the smallest amounts cause serious problems. And then my last book is called Growing Life. And it's about the paradigm change in agriculture to show how you can move away from toxic, environmentally destructive agriculture based on my 50 years of experience as a farmer and also working in around 100 countries with agriculture. And that book's called Growing Life. Julian, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm Julian Cripp. I'm a science writer. I've been writing about science for now on 50 years. But about a quarter of a century ago, I started meeting a lot of depressed and frightened scientists as I was going around my, my job. And, you know, they were just handling data every single day that was telling them that the world was coming apart in one way or another. Um, and uh, I began paying attention to this, but at the very big scale. And I began to focus on the major problems, what it is that humans are doing to the planet, basically, that's making it uninhabitable. Uh, and there are 10 of these huge problems. We set up the Council for the Human Future to get focus, scientific focus, first of all, policy focus and public focus on what the 10 catastrophic threats are that humans are now facing and what we can bloody well do about them, how we can fix them. Uh, so that is the main focus of my effort. My Previous book was about uh, the future of the world food supply, what sort of a food system we need to feed the world through the peak in human population till women can get the population down to a sustainable level. Um, my, my latest book is, is Earth Detox about the, the chemical poisoning of the planet. And the current one I'm working on is called How to Fix a Broken Planet. And it's a, it's a whole ream of good suggestions for what we can do to clean up the mess that we humans have created. Great. Uh, Stephanie? Uh, yes, I'm Stephanie Zenev. I'm the author of this book, Toxic Legacy, which was published last ju June by uh, Chelsea Green Publishers. Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destro Destroying Our Health and the Environment. 
And I, I like to see that everybody on this panel seems to be moving towards solutions, or maybe we're doing solutions from the beginning, but I am also a little tired of talking about how toxic we are. And it would be really great if I could start to figure out and learn about how people are finding solutions to this mess. And uh, we really have to reach out to the general public and get them to be aware of the urgency of the situation, get them to be on board and get them to start eating healthy, living healthy and uh, promoting pressure on the farmers to change the way they grow food. Uh, my interest was in autism and um, I, I got really uh, determined to figure out what was causing the autism epidemic in this country. I think it's a crisis. Uh, now the estimates are like one in 37. I mean, the numbers keep going up and up and up. And I think that glyphosate is a major player. Of course, there's many, many other toxic exposures they have, but I really have singled out glyphosate as being special. It's the active ingredient in Roundup considered to be perfectly safe by the government unregulated, um, used pervasively on the food supply, and it's a slow, it's a slow kill, and it's causing all kinds of uh, health problems, not just the autism. Thank you. Ronnie? Yes, well, I've been an activist since the 60s, uh, and uh, partly because I grew up in what's called Cancer Alley. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the petrochemical center of the U.S. in southeast Texas on the Louisiana border, uh, but I got radicalized through the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, anti-nuclear movement, and uh, I've been involved uh, a, a long time in all these movements. Also, my grandparents were organic farmers in uh, Southeast Texas, so I was able to spend a lot of time on an organic farm growing up on the weekends and summers. So I, my last two books in 2020 was Grassroots Rising, which is essentially a roadmap for how organic and regenerative agriculture and food and land use, along with alternative energy can solve the climate crisis in the US and around the world. And then my 2021 book with Dr. Mercola was uh, the truth about COVID-19. And that was, that's the first bestseller I've ever written, but it's also the first book I've ever written where there was not a single review uh, because it was too controversial. And, and independent bookstores, which I've spent my whole life working with, none of them would sell the book. So that, that's been an interesting uh, experience. But I spend, uh, I like to say, I spend half my time exposing the bad stuff. You know, we sue companies, we, we uh, expose companies, do boycotts, protests, and so on. But the other half of my life in Regeneration International is the positive part where at the moment we're just trying to identify the best practices around the world uh, and figure out how these can be scaled up. So I've become a farmer. I direct a research farm in northern Minnesota and also one in north central Mexico. So very happy to be on this panel and uh, very happy to be a person uh, working to bring the natural health movement the food movement, the climate movement, the anti-war movement, and the justice movements uh, together. And Jeffrey. Thank you. Um, for 26 years, I've been focusing on the exposing the health dangers of genetically engineered foods and Roundup, and also the corrupt regulatory process and the corrupt processes that and lies that were dished out by Monsanto and other advocates. Since GMO 2.0 is on us with gene editing and gene drives, et cetera, we've pivoted at the Institute for Responsible Technology. Gene editing is so cheap and easy, you can get a do-it-yourself kit on Amazon for under $200. And, if, and it also is prone to side effects like all GMOs. So we're concerned that this generation could leave a corrupt and replaced nature for all future generations. So we understand that the most serious and dangerous kingdoms to genetically engineer are the microbes, the microbiome. So we have a program at protectnaturenow.com to protect the global microbiome. And if you go to Protect Nature Now, you can see our, my latest film called Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. It's just 16 minutes. It's a wake up call. And it's one of the existential threats that I hope Julian will add to his list to make 11. Okay, very, very quickly, because I do think it's important. Can we bring up Joanna's website very quickly? <laughs> I 
Joanna, what is your website? Uh, you can go to either joannamore.com or sensitivecanary.com. It'll take you to the same place. And I can just say briefly that um, I have a, while there are a lot of chronic illnesses that are caused by toxic chemical exposure, including uh, from the chemicals on our food and contamination on our food, there's, uh, there's over 50 some, I think that I just logged in researching my book and I wasn't really trying. I was focusing on um, chronic fatigue and multiple chemical sensitivity, which is what I have when I started um, researching for my book. Uh, so that's where the sensitive canary comes from. Okay, so if they want to get in touch with you, they go to your website and, uh, and there's a contact to contact you and more information. Okay, great. Uh, Andre, what about your website? Can we bring up Andre's website? Which website? Uh, I don't have one. The best one is international, uh, Regeneration International, www.regenerationinternational.org. Okay, regenerationinternational.org. Yeah, and that, that people will then see what we, what we are doing. Okay, and what, if they That's want right. to stay in touch with you, is there something they should do here? Yeah, you'll find my, my emails there and my, my contact details are, are there. And you, you take donations to support your, your work? I certainly do. <laughs> Very happy to take donations. All welcome. Okay, great. And Julian, which website would be best for people to find you? Uh, JulianCrib.net uh, um, or humanfuture.org. So uh, let me just share my screen. Oh, sorry, fell away. No, oh, I don't know why it's dropping out. Okay, we'll do it up here. So uh, human future. That's, uh, th that's my personal website, which, uh, which has um, a, a, a range of, uh, of, of my publications. You can see there's a lot about food there. I've been writing about food for heaven knows how long. Um, they're all science-based, uh, and, and uh, there's a, a lot of blogs and, and so forth. But the one I would just like to show you is the Human Future website, uh, humanfuture.org. which basically talks about the, uh, the risks that we're facing. The combination of these risks. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Senoff, where should they go to find, is there a website for you? Yes, yeah, it's stephaniesenoff.net. And uh, that's my book, and, and you can uh, go to the book uh, po portion of this and um, find out where to get my book. And if you go into book there, um, you have uh, places you know that sell my book, Toxic Legacy. And then I have a, a blog, and I have a section with interviews and presentations, so that you can see that stuff at the top has various branches that, like the blog, for example. So there's um, you know information various kinds of information, interviews and blog presentations, publications. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and Ronnie, which website is best for you? Uh, www.organicconsumers.org uh, or else uh, regenerationinternational.org. Those are in English and vorganica.org in Spanish. So, Ronnie, I'm very familiar with this website. You've been sending me stuff for years. It's, it really, it's a ton of fantastic, heroic work that this website has done that you started. Um, how long has it been going on for? Uh, we farmed uh, OCA in 1998. And before that, from 92 to 98, we had a thing called the Pure Food Campaign. Mm -hmm. So we have archived several hundred thousand 
articles over time on organicconsumers.org. And, you know, we most of our readers, believe it or not, come through social media nowadays. So we've got 2 million followers on for millions against Monsanto and organic consumers, uh, social media. And does, do you, is, how do you finance it? Is, is it through donations? Yeah, we have, uh, we get small donations and then we have a few major donors like uh, uh, Dr. Mercola and Abby Rockefeller and a few others. But most of our money has always come from grassroots donations of $50 or less, but we, we get a lot of them. Okay, you guys are heroes. I've been following this long before The Real Truth was doing anything, and I felt very inspired that there was someone fighting for us. So thank you uh, for creating Organic Consumers Association and all the people that worked with you. This is, you know, I mean, I'm, there's a lot of organizations. I just happen to be familiar with, with this one. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Jeffrey, which website? Responsibletechnology.org. That's the Institute for Responsible Technology. We have a regular newsletter. Uh, we have social media, and we also do accept donations as well. And this has, if you scroll down, this has a lot of uh, detail about GMOs. It describes it in lots of different ways to get your information. Right there, what are you looking for? It explains it, the basics, GMOs. It's really tells you everything you want to know to learn more about this. And Jeffrey, it seems like the one thing I've always felt is that you're not good at, because you're good at a lot of things, but you don't seem good at asking for donations. You don't seem to like to ask people. And I feel like I'd rather, be, instead of giving to the Real Truths Membership Club, I'd rather they gave to this, because I feel if you stop doing this, um, you know, there's, no one, there's not that many people fighting for us. So it's very important that Institute for Responsible Technology thrive. So how can we help you? What exactly could all of us do to make sure that you have the resources to fight and do what you're doing? Thank you, Stephen. You're right. I have been negligent in my life and it shows. <laughs> uh, we've been operating on um, smoke and mirror budgets for a long time. Uh, there's a donate button at responsibletechnology.org. And I recommend that people make a recurring donation of any, any amount they can afford so we can then plan for that with our budgets and our hiring and our projects. And with this uh, Protect Nature Now campaign to protect the global microbiome, we're gonna be needing to open offices around the world, create international treaties, uh, national and local laws, uh, a popular culture of products. It's, it's gonna be huge and it's, we're, we're up against a very urgent and encroaching problem. So thank you, uh, Stephen, for mentioning that. And I also encourage you to donate to the other nonprofits that are here as well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, it's really uh, quite an accomplishment to gather this group of people. Um, I know a lot of people, times we focus on diet, at the real truth about health. Um, the topics that we're talking about here um, are super urgent. It was interesting. We opened the conference the first night with a panel on Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And there was a doctor, a medical doctor, Ray Dorsey, who wrote a book on Parkinson's called The End of Parkinson's and Dale Bredesen about the end of Alzheimer's. And it might as well, they, I was thinking they really should be on this panel because half of the things they were saying or more were related to exactly what we're gonna be talking about. And then all throughout the conference, every single lecturer talked about what diet to have. And then they talked about lifestyle. And more and more, it's clear that it's not just um, what foods you eat, it's how they are grown and everything else in our atmosphere. So I'm very grateful to all of you. A little bit afraid to ask you direct questions in that I almost don't wanna hear the answer to some of them, but that's why we're here so that hopefully we hear it and then we all take action. So um, no one wants to see a kid standing by the edge of a pool because they could fall in, but you want to be alerted that there's a kid by the edge of the pool, so you still have a chance to run as fast as you can and take them away from the edge of the pool. The purpose of this panel is so everyone says, wow, I didn't understand this is where we are. Now I do, and to be as urgent as possible. I hope everyone who's watching this understands that the speakers tonight are doing everything they can 
they're handing it off to you. In other words, there's nothing, they're writing books, they're writing movies, they have organizations, they speak constantly, they're doing everything they can. So please follow up and take action. And if you don't have the time and the energy to, to, to follow up and write your own books and give lectures, that's fine. Please financially support these people so they can represent us. Okay, now all of you have the ability to give very powerful, long detailed answers. There are six of you and I wanna go through a lot of material. So I'd like to go in this order, Joanna, Andre, Julian, Stephanie, Ronnie and Jeffrey. That's Joanna, Andre, Julian, Stephanie, Ronnie and Jeffrey. When I ask a question, everyone take only 30 seconds to answer it, three minutes per question. If five people pass, then the sixth person has three minutes. If everyone speaks, it's only 30 seconds. I realize that you want to go on to more topics, but I will get to more thing. I will get to each thing. So let's get started and let's try this where everyone go in order, just say pass or a, give a 30 second answer. But if someone didn't use their 30 seconds, you can use theirs. If four people didn't use their thirties, then you have two minutes. Okay, here we go. First question I want to ask, and any we can go in this will go in this order for all of them. And again, just say pass if it doesn't pertain to you or doesn't interest you. Um, um, what are the current autism rates, and why do you think it keeps going, getting worse? What do you expect it to be in ten years? And does the prediction of fifty percent of uh, people of babies being born in two thousand thirty-two still seem accurate? Um, and uh, Again, and what is the and what is the, the the reason that you think that we're having this autism rate? So that's the first question. Well, I'll just contribute a piece of the answer, and, and that's um, we have chemicals that are altering generations. They're altering children before they're born. They're actually altering three generations ahead of time. So um, we just need to be aware that things are happening in our environment and in our bodies that are affecting children going forward. Thank you. And feel free, by the way, to tell us we're over 30 seconds because okay. it's a little stressful. Okay. <laughs> Andre? Um, Andre? I hope I'm not breaking down. Um, what, one of the papers I was an author of with Dr. Stephanie Sennett showed the relationship between Roundup and the increase in autism. And we did a Pearson's correlation coefficient on it, showing that there's a one in 10,000 chance that this is accidental. After we published that paper, there's a very good study showing how the smallest amounts of glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, damages the development of nerves. And of course, the brain is the biggest collection of nerves. So we now actually have good evidence-based science to show that small levels of Roundup are a, fa a factor in this autism epidemic. Julian? Yeah, um, the fact is that the world is being bathed in an absolute tidal wave of chemicals of all kinds. 220 billion tonnes of all kinds of chemicals are being released every year by human activity, right? Only 2.5 billion, uh, billion tonnes of chemicals are actually manufactured. The rest are just released by our normal activity. Now, this enormous assault, there's 350,000 man-made chemicals, um, this enormous assault includes an awful lot of chemicals known as neurotoxins or nerve poisons, and they are poisoning the brains of our children while they are still in the womb, uh, when they are newly born, when they take their first drink of their mother's milk, they, they're contaminated by these industrial chemicals. It's, it's a huge mixture. We, we honestly, we don't know the effects of the, of the chemicals individually, let alone the impact of this, this mixture, but it is affecting the human brain. How do we know that? We know that human IQ is currently falling at a rate of three points per decade. The humans are becoming dumber in, in every society, but particularly the over-chemicalized societies and every child on the planet is being poisoned at the moment. We need to do something about it. Stephanie? 
I guess I'm the source of that of that quote, <laughs> and it came from Aunt Andre's paper because he and uh, Nancy Swanson and, and someone else I forget who, but they published this amazing paper with all these charts of uh, perfect correlation between the rise in glyphosate usage and the rise in the huge list of diseases, one of which strikingly was autism, perfect match. And I just projected, I mean, actually, I looked at the curve for the, the, the some national government information about the, the trend in autism. If you just extend it, first of all, you see that it's exponential growth. And when you extend it, if it were to continue exponentially the way it was, that's where we would be in 2032. 50% of the kids, 80% of the boys born in 30, 2032 would end up on the autism uh, spectrum. I think that's absolutely shocking. I, I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, but I worry because we're not really fixing these problems. We're not, you know, the government is, doesn't seem to care that these kids are sick. So I wrote a lot about autism in my book on glyphosate. That's always been my focus. And I believe I've worked out exactly the mechanisms by which glyphosate would cause the actual symptoms that you see with autism. It's really a very, very good match. And I personally have no doubt that glyphosate's a major player, not the only player, but the, a major player in the epidemic. And I believe if we were to go if we were to convert our, our agriculture to be organic across the board, I bet you we'd see those autism rates go down pretty good, quickly. Ronnie? Yeah, well, I just, my son, my son who's 24 tells me, you know, often dad, you know, we, the younger generation know how bad the situation is. The problem is that most kids don't believe it can change. So I think as we broadcast the bad news, uh, we also need to give people hope that, hey, the darkest hour is always before the dawn. And that's where we are right now. Jeffrey? In uh, the film I did with Amy Hart, we have two autistic boys whose families converted to organic and the kids are no longer on the spectrum. In my film, Genetic Roulette, we have three families whose autistic sons also got dramatically better, but not yet off the spectrum. I remember t interviewing one woman who said, my son is 80% corrected in, in, her, in his autism. And people said, what'd you do? And she said, well, he's casein-free and he's gluten-free and he's 80% organic. And then she'd say the next person, he's 80% better. And she was well, casein-free, gluten-free and 80% are bad. Finally, she started hearing herself. 80% 80 80 better, 80% organic. She then realized, oh my goodness, shifted him to 100% organic and closed the gap. And he's virtually free of symptoms. So. Uh, I say, I'm just giving some personal experiences supporting some of the data you've already heard. How much have the sperm counts gone down in the last 40 years and why? And any information on how this is trending going forward? Uh, again, Joanna. Well, uh, so there is another individual that wrote a book specific to this topic who's, who's not here, but um, They've gone down, the quality of sperm have, have gone down. Um, our capacity to, as, in terms of average capacity to reproduce has gone down. We've had um, more individuals that identify as intersex or trans, transgender. And all of those changes are due to hormone disrupting chemicals that are used um, in pesticides, used by industry, used in consumer products that are quite quite omnipresent in our environment. Yeah, Shauna Swan wrote a book called, what's it called, Countdown? Countdown, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Andre? Yeah. I want to talk about the good news is that we, we do know that around much of the world that there's been a dramatic decline in uh, sperm counts since the 1930s, about two decades ago without noticing it in Denmark. So they did a uh, study on Danish organic farmers because they wanted to see if it was exposure to various chemicals that, that was causing this. These farmers had the same sperm counts as their grandfathers in the 1930s. Mm. So that was a fairly you know, good study showing that exposure to chemicals is a major reason for this uh, loss of sperm. Basically, the sperm count has gone down by 50 to 60% uh, in Western males, depending on which scientific paper you read. 
Um, yes, uh, end endocrine disrupting chemicals are identified as the major cause, but it's not just sperm counts. Female fertility is also falling. Um, gender identity is also changing. Uh, people don't know what gender they are quite as much as they used to do. Uh, men are starting to grow breasts, penises are shrinking. There are physical effects that are being observed uh, all around the world now as a result of these chemicals, not just in humans, but also in wildlife, extensively in wildlife, in fact. So we're con consuming, confusing the genders, uh, you know, universally with this avalanche of chemicals. Most of them begin as petrochemicals. You know, your, your baby, when it is comes into the world already shitting plastic, it, it, is, uh, it drinks from a bottle made of plastic. It goes to bed in, in, in sheets made from petrochemicals, on a mattress made from petrochemicals, in a house where the carpets and the furniture contain neurotoxins and endocrine disruptors. You know, this, this baby from birth is cocooned in these toxins. And, and it's very, very hard to get rid of them all. You know, let me tell you that. But only demand from, from human beings can actually stop this happening. Um, I, of course, like to talk about glyphosate, but I recognize there are many other chemicals that are also disrupting our re reproductive capacity. And I'm glad you brought up this whole issue of the transgender and all these issues people are having with confusion about their gender because these endocrine disruptors play a role in, in hormone regulation that's completely out of sync with what the body's supposed to be doing. So it really messes up the development. I have a whole chapter in my book on glyphosate and reproduction. And, um, and development and, and all the different papers that have shown that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. It operates at very low doses to cause problems. It actually prevents the production of estrogen from testosterone in the brain. And there's a, a theory that excess testosterone is linked to autism. And there are studies that have shown, there's a new study that came out on girl, on, um, girl babies having um, a, a, an anogenital distance that was too long associated with excess glyphosate in the urine of the mother, a very interesting new paper showing that there's this, this feature which is characteristic of, of, um, of a dysregulated um, hormone balance in the female that it, it, it is expressed as excess testosterone. And this is because glyphosate disrupts aromatase, which is the enzyme that converts estrogen to testosterone. And these people who have uh, this problem have a very high risk of developing polycystic ovary syndrome, which is now uh, very common these days all over the world. There's lots of polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a direct uh, problem. It uh, messes up the, um, the, the cycle, a very strong link to infertility in women. I think one cl class of chemicals we didn't discuss yet in this discussion right now is uh, the PFAS, the forever chemicals. Those yes. Those are really disruptive to um, the development, you know, the, the sexual development of human beings. And that's the no stick pans that um, Teflon. And, and those are going to end up also in, you know, the contamination is so widespread and the water supply is going to hit our soil, it's going to hit the food as well. Ronnie? Yeah, I think it's important to personify the uh, toxic chemicals that are gender bending and you know destroying fertility because we need to point out to people the history of companies like Monsanto and DuPont and 3M and these companies that knew all along the dangers of their chemicals but were tempted by the great profits that they could make and then were aided and abetted by governments who covered them up. I forgot to mention one thing about OCA is uh, our third largest source of income is suing corporations and winning in court. Last year, we raised $200,000 in damages from suing companies uh, like Monsanto and Cargill and uh, the rest of them. So I think we need to get more aggressive about this is really a farm of, of murder, premeditated homicide that's going on. And these people, uh, should not be able to hide behind their masks and their walls and their desks and their you know, credentials. Uh, we need to go after them and make them pay for what they've done. At and the same time, I do wanna say that we actually need to support these companies to transition into something better because you know, there's that old sort of story of analogy of who's better at getting somebody to take their coat off the wind or the sun, the harder the wind blows, the more the person clutches their coat. When the sun comes out, they take off their coat. So 
creating conditions in which companies feel supported and safe into transitioning something that they're still going to be around in 20 years actually makes it easier for them to do so uh, rather than just, uh, you know, um, giving them hardship and a lot of paperwork to deal with. They need to focus on innovation and implementation of solutions. Thank you. Um, in the movie Secret Ingredients, uh, we visit Dr. Marsha Schaefer's clinic. She's a chiropractor and she's been attracting a lot of infertile couples and she puts them all on an organic diet <clears throat> and she had a 100% success rate. <clears throat> Some of these people have been gone to fertility clinics with diagnoses, without diagnoses, but everyone that followed the protocol had children. And the last time I talked to her was 123 couples. So uh, going organic is very, very powerful. And you can see the story in Secret Ingredients. Are we losing our bees and pollinators? How have the number of pollinators changed in the last 25 years? And do you know why? And why does this matter? I'm going to pass. To... I'm happy to talk on that because there's a word, insectageddon. And what we're seeing is a incredible ecological crash of insects and includes bees and other pollinators of which pesticides have a major role but I'd also very much like to echo what Julian and Stephanie have said that endocrine disruptors are very important because what we're doing is disrupting the reproduction of the whole of our ecosystems because nearly everything on this planet uses the same um, basic hormones, estrogen and testosterone for reproduction. There's only a few exceptions. And these chemicals are affecting the whole of our you know, biome on this planet. Includes insects, which are really a really important part of the food chain. So what we're seeing a whole crash in birds and frogs, reptiles and so on. And you know, we'll see a crash in us because we're the top of that food chain. And we have made this insect to get, get them. Yeah, I, I'd like to follow on from there. Uh, according to WWF and people who study these things, there's basically been a 70% reduction in the number of large animals and birds and fish on the face of this planet since the mid 1970s. And insects too have crashed. And if insects crash, bird numbers go down, reptile numbers go down, everything that eats insects disappears as well. So, you know, we've set off a, a phase of extinction, which is currently running, and get this, it's currently running three times faster than the extinction episode when the dinosaurs were taken out. Okay, it, it, it's phenomenal, the rate of destruction, the havoc that humans are wreaking on wildlife. Even, you know, in the most remote corners of the planet, you can, you, at the bottom of the oceans, top of Mount Everest, uh, the remotest atolls in the Pacific Ocean, you can find animals that are contaminated with human industrial chemicals. These things have spread all around the planet. The snow of Antarctica is contaminated. The snow on Mount Everest is contaminated. So it is, it is the spread of these things. And of course, people who live in, in, in centres of population are particularly contaminated. The air they breathe, the, the place they live, the food they eat, all of it is contaminated. Every moment of the day, every one of us is getting these things. So we, we need to understand the scale of this disaster that we have unleashed. And it is five times larger than the climate disaster that we have unleashed in terms of the volume of stuff that we're pumping into the biosphere and killing things with, it's five times larger. And just to bring that home to us, we're killing, according to the World Health Organization, 12.6 million people every single year through chemical poisoning of one sort or another. Okay, now that is a rate of preventable homicide, which is double the death toll in World War II. This is the worst case of preventable homicide in Earth's history. You know, and, and people are just not aware and governments are permitting and enabling it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, unless we do something about it, you know, unless we speak out, uh, basically it's gonna keep on going forever.
Um, I have a lot to say about the bees and I wrote about it in the book. There's actually uh, articles uh, that have shown glyphosate disrupting the bees uh, gut microbiome, causing them to uh, not nurture the, the young bees properly in the, in the, uh, um, in the uh, honeycomb, the uh, beehive, sorry, I lost that word. And um, going out and getting uh, lost and not being able to come back, you know, when they're left loose to try to fertilize the crops um, because they're getting essentially bee Alzheimer's. I think that um, chlorpyrifos has been identified as a, as a suspect in killing off the bees. I think glyphosate is at least as, as powerful as chlorpyrifos and it's um, working synergistically with the insecticides because glyphosate disrupts the enzymes in the liver that detoxify the, the toxic insecticides. So they're working collaboratively to, to destroy the bees. And I remember there was a paper on honey and the levels of glyphosate in honey. And they, they looked at all kinds of different samples of honey from countries, Mexico, United States, Canada, um, found glyphosate in almost every sample they looked at and found the highest levels consistently in the samples from the United States. So honey has, is contaminated because the bees are being exposed and it's killing the bees. And we're gonna have a really big crisis once we don't have our pollinators with the food problem. Actually, yeah, also uh, an EPA whistleblower has said that the real reason why we are, we are instructed not to give honey to infants is not because of some, the bacteria in there, it's because of the contamination and the toxic chemicals that make the young body vulnerable to infection botulism and, and, you know, very strong infections. So it's really that contamination in honey that becomes the hazard for infants, not any actual organism. That's a good point. In fact, I think a lot of the foods that would normally be very healthy are no longer healthy because of the chemicals that are in them. The fish with the uh, mercury and um, liver, you know, liver is a very healthy food, but it's so full of toxins that it, the liver's not edible anymore, the liver from the cow, for example, they don't even sell it. It probably looks terrible. It's probably got fatty liver disease. And it's very sad that these highly nutritious foods are not, uh, are not really safe anymore. Mm -hmm. Ronnie? Yeah, I'll just second what everyone has said. We raise bees here on this farm. We have 27 hives and we try to teach <clears throat> the school kids who come here every day to visit about the importance of bees and pollinators and including bats who are the main pollinators for the agave plants that are so important to us. I remember talking to Dr. Don Huber and at the time neonicotinoid insecticides were being implicated for colony collapse disorder. He said, when you look at the symptoms of the bees, it doesn't make sense because there are certain aspects that could not be explained by the neonicotinoids, but can be explained by glyphosate. They die of starvation, but there's plenty of bee bread around. And so he said, it's they need the lactobacillus in their gut to digest, and that's easily killed by the glyphosate. So that was one of the examples. They also said that under environmentally um, relevant conditions, the amount of glyphosate that we would find in agricultural areas, a, a study showed 30 something percent death rate in these hives just exposed to glyphosate. One company was studying this called Biologics and then they, that Biologics company got purchased by Monsanto and stopped studying it. Hmm. Could I add something there that, that basically, uh, you know, it's not individual chemicals that are doing this. It is the whole bloody mixture. It is the 350,000 chemical that are being produced industrially worldwide at the moment. Uh, and as I say, that we're inhaling them with every breath, we're, we're swallowing them, with, we're ingesting them with every drink and, and every meal, and we're surrounded by them in our homes and our workplaces and elsewhere. And it, it is these chemicals and the daughter products that, that, that they engender. These chemicals, once they're, they're unleashed in the environment, they don't just go away. They, they interact with one another and produce new generations of chemicals that we've never seen before. They're, they're out there, you know, reacting with natural things and reacting with unnatural things. So it, it's the overall bath and the science has got very little information at the moment on the problem of mixtures, because it's the mixtures that really are starting to hit us. Tens of thousands of chemicals every single day. Uh, you know, it, the whole thing, everybody, 
focuses on the one chemical, you know, which has got these properties and those properties. And if we have it at a small enough dose level, nobody's going to get hurt. That's absolute rubbish because that chemical is going to interact with a lot of similar chemicals that have exactly the same effect on your liver or your brain. So it's going to multiply the effect of those chemicals on you. People don't seem to understand that this is the issue. It's the chemical bath that we're in that that is really affecting us. I agree with you. And our bodies are really set up with a, we're redundant. We have so many redundancies and that's really the reason why we're still alive really. And with all the environmental pollution we have, in addition to chemical pollution, there's the EMF pollution that we've introduced. And that's, that's on my mind because there are studies of bees and how they respond to just being exposed to a cell phone. And as somebody who's chemically sensitive and, and I'm chemically sensitive because I have a chemical injury, I'm also uh, sensitive to wireless technologies. I'm using an ether landline to connect with you today. But it's those, it's, we have an onslaught of environmental pollution. And if we start to remove this onslaught, then our bodies can start to heal and our environment can start to heal and our ecosystems can start to heal. Okay, let me ask you, um, some questions about um, GMOs regarding feeding the world. Which of these statements are accurate? GM crops are needed to feed the world's growing population. GM crops are vital to achieve food security. Anti-GMO activists in wealthy countries are keeping people in poor countries hungry by denying them GM crops. GMOs are needed to provide the crops that will enable us to survive the challenges ahead. Well, what GMOs are needed for is to help industry maintain market power. Uh, so um, I think Jeffrey can probably talk a lot more about that, but one of the chapters in my book that maybe uh, got me excited in a particular way was about uh, the, the market power issues because I started out as an, as an antitrust law attorney. So everything had to do with market power. And really, um, you know, a lot of these biotechnologies are designed to let's make something fancy so that we can hold it over people's heads, uh, have them become dependent on it, whether it's legally or financially, and then uh, expand our power and secure an industry for ourselves. So that's just kind of an overview more a little bit about that um, more detail in my book but i'm guessing there's other people who really here who can talk to that topic in particular andre the, the real issue here is is that the world actually produces three times more food than we need and we may waste most of it there is no shortage of food we have very unfair and inefficient distribution systems. And really what we need to go back to are local systems. And I can say this pandemic and now the war in Ukraine has shown the problems with these global supply chains. We are looking like we're gonna face a famine now simply because these long distance supply chains, growing all this food in one country, bringing it to another are failing Whereas we know with local food, and, and when I worked in iPhone, for instance, in Africa, we could work with um, local farmers and get 100% increase in production and feed their communities. And this is what we're doing. And this is the real solution, not long distance GMOs to go to, go to small, um, to most of these countries, because where, where we have food insecurity, because the truth is, this is an issue of poverty. The people who are hungry are hungry because they cannot afford to buy it. It doesn't matter how much we grow. We need to help them grow it and do it locally and look at it from a holistic way and poverty reduction. And we can do it through very good agroecological systems. And we are doing it actually. This is the really important thing. We are doing it with millions already. Julian? I agree 100% with, with Andre. Uh, basically, it is the explosion in industrial agriculture since the end of World War II that, that it is really threatening to destroy the, you know, the entire habitable planet. I mean, it's devouring the soils. We're losing soil uh, at, at a rate of 75 billion tonnes every single year. And that's cumulative. So we're going to lose half the world's soils by the middle of the century. 
Um, water is running out everywhere you look, but particularly in places like China and India, highly populous countries which have not got enough water to grow the food that they will need in future. So they're having to import their food from Africa or strange places like that. So, you know, really we've created an, an industrial rod for our own back. Apart from the fact that, that the industrial food system produces 30% of the greenhouse emissions and it spreads 5 million tonnes of pesticide all around the planet, you know, it, it's anathema. But it's, the good news is it's going to break down. It's going to break down in the mid-century due to the climate impacts and the scarcities that I've mentioned. So this is an opportunity for us to completely rethink food. And I've proposed in a book called Food or War, because war is the alternative, you don't have enough food. Uh, basically what, what, what Andre is saying that, uh, you know, first of all, regenerative agriculture. Secondly, urban food production. Our cities worldwide throw away all of their nutrients, you know, and, 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 and a huge quantity of water, something like two thirds of the world's nutrients are trashed by urban waste disposal systems. Um, and that can all be, those nutrients can be recaptured and reused, but they're not being at the moment. So recycled food through cities, renewable food, as I call it, through the cities and deep ocean aquaculture, which is a, a, a far less intensive, you don't need chemicals, blah, blah, blah. Uh, form of, of sea farming, um, because we're running out of fish. The, the, the world fish harvest is, is just about bottomed out now. Uh, it's not going to last you know, very much longer, the, the rate at which the Chinese are mining the oceans. So basically, you know, we're going to have to rethink food in its totality. And regenerative farming worldwide is part of that solution. There are three, there are three pillars, I say, regenerative farming, uh, urban food production, renewable urban food production, and deep ocean aquaculture. Stephanie? Uh, yes, um, so I think um, it, there was this image when they first came up with these GMOs that it was going to reduce the usage of pesticides, and actually it did the opposite. And of course they thought glyphosate was very safe compared to the other pesticides, so they produced all these GMOs, most of the GMOs, I think the majority, are related to uh, protection against glyphosate, which of course allowed them to grow their crops very cheaply, just spray the glyphosate all over the crop and the crop doesn't die, you kill the weeds. Um, and initially they saw a, a significant increase in yield the first year, they were very happy, but year by year, the yield kept going down and down and down. The amount of glyphosate they had to use kept going up because the weeds were developing resistance. So you saw this enormous increase in the use of glyphosate over those 10 years after they introduced the GMO Roundup Ready crops back in the late 1990s. And, and meanwhile, the soil is not only being washed away because it doesn't have enough organic matter. It's being depleted of its nutrients, depleted of its minerals, depleted of its micro microbiome is messed up. All of these issues with the soil, uh, damage to the soil because of the, of the chemical use of the Roundup. Um, so that by the, by the time you've been using Roundup for four or five, six years, your soil is much worse shape. Your plant is much more susceptible to insects. The plant doesn't have the kind of hardy resistance to insects and to fungicides. The, fun the fungus problem becomes much more uh, problematic too. So your plants are really suffering from the damage they're experiencing from the exposure to the glyphosate, the soil, the plants, the microbes in the soil, all of them are being messed up by the, uh, by the chemicals that are being enabled by the GMO. So it's really a very broken system. And as, as everyone's been saying, we need to think in terms of regenerative, not just organic, but regenerative, and also using completely natural systems in the agriculture. No, no nitrate fertilizers, no phosphate fertilizers. We need to get back to a completely natural way of growing food. I think on small farms with many different products, not just a monocrop, uh, huge you know, farm mechanistic with all the uh, machinery. We need to go back to the kind of farming that is still taking place in places like Africa. Ronnie? Yeah, none of those things <clears throat> have turned out to be true about GMOs, but I think it's also important that we point out to people that uh, they realize now that the majority of the public is starting to understand this, and so they're introducing uh, genetically engineered foods and products and just calling them by other names. Gene editing, lab meat, you know, they call it plant-based foods that aren't really plant-based. And uh, we've got to expose uh, the synthetic biology uh, wave or 
genetic engineering point two point two point oh, as a lot of people say. So, uh, and I think it's important to realize that we have educated the majority of the public uh, to understand that organic foods are have more nutrition and they're better. The problem is when <clears throat> most people are at the checkout counter and they pull out their wallet, what they realize is there's not enough money in there uh, to buy 100% organic, local, regenerative. So really, we've got to stop thinking that economic justice is a separate issue from healthy food and farming, you know, because the majority of our population um, so think that organic food it costs too much. And it, what it means is that the rest of their life is so expensive that they are cutting corners. And unfortunately, they're cutting corners with organic. But the pandemic, it's interesting, organic sales grew faster than ever, <clears throat> as did uh, natural health supplements and home cooking. So I think people have gotten a taste now of their priorities uh, and uh, we got to build on that. But we also got to make sure that low income people and middle class and working class people have enough money in their wallets to buy the organic products that they need. There was a very comprehensive uh, report called the ISTAD report commissioned by the United Nations in 2008, 2,500 pages, over 400 scientists. And they concluded that GMOs have nothing to offer to feed the hungry world, eradicate poverty, or create sustainable agriculture. I interviewed many of the chief writers of this, including the co-chairman, and they agreed, saying that GMOs basically are uh, a solution or a problem looking for a solution or a solution looking for a problem. It had no fit. There was They do not increase average yield, whereas regenerative practices can double yield in developing countries. They, they create a model of monoculture, which is inappropriate for most of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And they wrote extensively on it. It's kind of the science is settled by the world's experts, but that has never stopped the biotech industry from repeating myths and then paying others to echo chamber those myths. So you'll still hear these lies, but it is clearly, clearly not the solution to feed the world. Uh, tell me about these uh, additional comments, uh, statements about GMOs, and let me know if these are true regarding the genetic engineering technique. Genetic engineering is just an extension of natural breeding. Genetic engineering is precise, and the results are predictable. Gen ne genetic engineering of crops is no more risky than mutation breeding, which is widely accepted and not regulated. Cisgenesis is a safe form of GM because no foreign genes are involved. Um, and let me go, uh, yeah, so let's just go through that one quickly Any on those, so let's go through that quickly. Well, I'll just say that these statements can appear from industry and sometimes they can also appear from governments because unfortunately in industry has a very strong influence on governments, on intergovernmental organizations, on universities, on all these institutions that we trust. So we may hear these statements from institutions that we think are credible, but unfortunately they're not representing our best interests, nor are they representing reality. Okay, uh, as a plant breeder, I can tell you that genetic engineering is very, very different from traditional breeding because in traditional breeding, we can only breed closely related species. With genetic engineering, what they're doing for the first time is they're, they're actually crossing genetic material from different kingdoms that don't normally do. So, so you can start putting bacteria or virus particles into plants. This, and the fact is we, we do not have the precise science to know exactly what are the long-term um, effects. The, we know that the offspring of, of these, when, when they, they cross out, that, 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 the, that there is incredible variability, there's unpredictability. The, the other, yeah, I suppose 
the best thing to do, and I'll probably let um, Jeffrey talk about it, because when he talked about genetic roulette, what we're actually doing is playing Russian roulette with the basis of life. We're using a very, very out of date 1960s idea of, of the way the genome works. And the fact is, the genome or the, you know, the, the gene structure is far more complex than the simplistic ideas that they use when they start inserting a gene. And, you know, I suppose the best way to say it, we're playing God and we don't know what, what the hell we are doing. Yeah, I would like to, to add to that, that um, the, 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 the gene technology issue is part of a very much larger problem. And the problem is that technology at large is out of control. Okay, so it's not just biotechnology, it is nanotechnology, it is artificial intelligence, it is robot killing machines. There is a whole host of technologies which the private sector is developing willy-nilly ad lib all around the world um, and which are not controlled by any government anywhere. Uh, they're so far ahead of the, of the regulatory and legislatory uh, processes that it's not funny. Um, the genies are out of the bottle in all of these areas. Every single one of these, of these technologies, these super technologies, has the capacity to do us terrible harm um, but nobody is nobody's shining a warning light, you know, except for you, ladies and gentlemen, really. Uh, the, the danger is that we're going to be devoured by these technologies in different ways. I mean, think of nanotechnology. You're talking about terribly, terribly small particles entering into the brains and the embryos and the bodies of every single human on Earth. And yet, you know, what, what attempt is there to regulate nanotechnology, uh, you know, biotechnology? Or, you know, not just uh, in, in the area of crops and food, but, but also, you know, people are tinkering with wild viruses and doing strange things to them in, in dark laboratories funded by the US government, the Chinese government. You know, I'm not a conspiracist, so I'm a reader of the science, okay? And I can tell you, I do not like what I see, that large grants are being given to institutions to carry out, to try to produce, uh, to uprate. The, the potential of disease causing organisms to cause more disease because they want to experiment with it. You know? mm -hmm. It's utter madness. Um, so what we actually need is a way of controlling all new technologies, not just one at a time. You try and control them one at a time, it's like controlling chemicals one at a time. It'll take you a third of a million years. If you, all technologies have to come under some kind of regulation and scrutiny to say, are they good for people or are they bad for people? You know, this has got to happen at the global level. It can't just happen at national level. Thanks. I'd like to talk about CRISPR technology in particular, because that's an interesting technology that is uh, very exciting to the agrochemical industry, because they believe now that they can create things like ground up ready crops, glyphosate resistance without invoking GMO technology. So they've managed to get the governments to agree that this CRISPR technology is not a GMO because what they're doing is they're actually going in and modifying the actual gene that the plant originally had to turn it into a version of that gene that is resistant to the, to the herbicide. So they can now roll out all these new crops that have gen resistance to, uh, to the chemical herbicides and they don't have to call it a GMO because it's CRISPR, but CRISPR is definitely not safe. And so there's many studies coming out recently that are showing you know, again, they talk about precision technology, but actually they're finding it's doing all kinds of strange things they didn't expect. And it's really very much un an unknown question as to what kind of to toxicity the actual CRISPR uh, um, stuff is going to cause on top of, of course, allowing them to produce uh, resistant crops that are not uh, labeled, not don't need to be labeled GMO. Ronnie. Well, I think it's very important that we <clears throat> realize that industry is working overtime to uh, keep on doing the same dangerous things they're doing. And one of the things that bothers me is uh, vegans uh, and vegetarians being attracted to these so-called <clears throat> plant-based meats and dairy products that are not plant-based. I mean, if you want to eat a veggie burger, great with organic ingredients made from vegetables, that's one thing. 
but what the impossible burger, the, mm -hmm. you know, the robot ice cream, I can't even believe they're actually just using these names. And then they exhibit at the Natural and Organic Products Expo uh, last month in Ana Anaheim. The featured new products at Natural Products Expo were gene, uh, gene edited, lab engineered, fake foods that are gonna have a disastrous impact uh, <clears throat> on the environment, as well as small farmers and people around the world. So we gotta fight over time. A lot of the millennials, for, because they don't like factory farming and animal cruelty, uh, because they've read this propaganda from industry about um, you know, how animal husbandry is a major contributor. Uh, we need to fight these battles. So I'm looking forward to suing some of these companies mm -hmm. in the next uh, few months. And uh, we got to do this. I'd like to follow up on the CRISPR piece. Uh, because of the, the alarming rate in which governments are allowing gene edited organisms to be deregulated, uh, India is the most recent. So in CRISPR, you have a molecular scissors that cuts and you have a guide that finds the location of the DNA. One thing that everyone knows is it gets cut all over the place, not just in the targeted place. Once it's cut, it's not the engineer that puts it back together, it's the cell's own repair mechanisms and we have no control over it. There are deletions, insertions, mutations that can occur, even something called chromothripsis where the entire chromosome gets shattered and reformed in a haphazard way. During the process of repair, the genome repair mechanism can grab DNA from the Petri dish. It can grab some of the bacterial DNA that was used to get the gene edited machinery in there. It can grab uh, DNA from goats and cows because they often use the serum from goats and cows. So you end up with mice and, and cows with foreign DNA that are not typically evaluated. When CRISPR is used to knock out a gene, they assume the gene is, is shut off and everything's safe. But one third of the time it fails, and often when it fails, it produces a truncated protein. And that truncated protein can be an allergen or a toxin. Now, once you've created the gene edited cell, you have to replicate it through tissue culture or cloning that introduces hundreds or thousands of other mutations. When you bring in the gene machinery, that causes insertion mutations and fragments throughout the DNA. These changes not only change the genome, but the epigenetic effects, how genes express, and epigenetic effects from CRISPR have been passed on to at least 10 generations of mice. And we have a situation where in one, in one article in Nature, they looked at three different CRISPR studies on human embryos and they called it chromosomal mayhem. So it is a disaster scientifically, and yet the biotech industry has convinced government after government that it is safe, predictable, and natural. So that's one of the campaigns that our institute is initiating is to, re, is to show the truth to these regulators and lawmakers about CRISPR. Hey, I'd like to ask you each a different question. When you answer it, please repeat the question again. Okay, so the questions I'd like to ask everyone is, Joanna, in your book, Silent Winter, tell us about the chapter called Our Current Trajectory. Andre, um, you wrote that or, uh, an article, there's an article that says, cancer is the leading cause of death from disease in children. The number of cancer cases per 100,000 children increased 43% from 1975 to 2018. If you could tell us more about that. Julian, please tell us about the chapter in your book called Poisoning a Planet. Stephanie, is there any scientific evidence that glyphosate and other chemicals are contributing to neurological order, disorders? And you could explain what a neurological disorder is. Ronnie, um, you wrote a book called Grassroots Rising, a call to action on climate, farming, food, and a Green New Deal. Please tell us why you wrote this book and what it was about. 
and Jeffrey, um, can you tell us, I'm gonna list an, another, another bunch of comments about GMOs. Please tell me um, about these comments and if they're accurate. Um, GM foods are strictly tested and regulated for safety. Independent studies confirm that GM foods and crops are safe. The Nicola Review compiled 1,700 plus studies showing that GMs are safe. GM foods are safe to eat. The Seralini 2012 study was bad science and no conclusions could be drawn from it. Many long-term studies show GM is safe. EU research shows GM foods are safe. Those who claim that GM foods are unsafe are being selective with the data since many other studies show safety. GM foods are safe for human consumption. No one has ever been made ill by GM food. GM, BT, insecticidal crops only harm insects and are harmless to animal and people. GM foods are rigorously assessed for their ability to cause allergic reactions. GM animal feed poses no risk to animal or human health and genetic engineering will deliver more nutritious crops. If you could each comment, repeat your question as best you can um, and comment on your question, starting with uh, Joanna. Okay, so uh, the question was about uh, one of the first chapters in my book, Our Current Trajectory. And uh, what I wanted to do in this particular chapter is to really look at the big picture of where we're heading based on what we're doing now, where we are now. And we're really in kind of a pickle, both where in a, an economic system that is um, causing problems and we're in, in a health crisis. If you think about uh, what we've been doing to the environment, that's something that you know, we've, we all notice that these systems are breaking down in the environment because of the pollution we've introduced, the problems we've introduced. But now we're to the point where the systems within our bodies are breaking down. We are an ecosystem also and we have introduced pollution and problems that are not only breaking down the environment, but they're breaking down our bodies. And that's the cause of chronic illness is that pollution. It's breaking down that ecosystem. Uh, the saddest part of it is that really the same companies that are producing the toxic chemicals that are polluting the environment, that are undermining the, the ecosystem, and that are now undermining our bodies are, and are causing chronic illness, are really the same companies that are selling us the solutions, the chemicals that we need to take in order to maintain our health. Bayer, you know, if you look at Bayer Monsanto, that is one example, but there's many others and the consolidation in the industries are showing that that's the case. So um, if we you know, look out in the future, people becoming, um, having less energy, uh, having less capacity to be healthy, and relying more now on those same industries to keep them alive. That's not the future we want. We need to turn the ship around and we need to do that as individuals and as institutions by um, investing in what we need, not on what's going to cause, give us a ten, tenfold or hundredfold or more return on investment. Andre? Um, I'm a bit better if I unmute. Um, my question is about childhood cancer. I actually wrote a bit about it in my second book, Poisoning Our Children. And why I wanted to feature it is because childhood cancer is increasing. And in that book, one of the studies I gave was published by the International Agency for uh, Research into Cancer, the World Health Organ organization cancer agency and published in the lancet oncology which is regarded as probably one of the best peer-reviewed journals into um, cancer studies and what this showed is in in the decade um, from 2000 to 2010 childhood cancers increased by 13 percent and you know the sad thing about most of these cancers is that they tend to be fatal, very fatal. The point, the other point I really wanted to make there, and what I wanted to show in this book is also in 2010 there was the uh, United States President's um, Cancer Panel Report under um, President Obama that was put together by over 30 of the world's best cancer specialists, and what they showed is that the 80 percent of cancers 
pesticides, chemicals, radiation. There's a whole Andre, Andre, we're going to come back to you. We're going to let Julian speak. You're freezing. So Julian, why don't you continue your question? Yeah, uh, my question was about the chapter on poisoning a planet. Now, we, we tended to think for, for a long, long time about pollution as being something that happens locally, right? It's a Minamata. Uh, it's a Bhopal. It, it's an event. It's a city like the London smog or something like that, a city being poisoned by its own air. But things have changed radically in the last 30 or 40 years. And the major change is that the chemicals have spread out across the entire planet. So the pollution of India and China blows across to North America and blows across to Europe. Um, chemicals, volatile chemicals, uh, you know, are released and then they get bound to other particles and then they get released again. They get carried through the world's oceans. They get carried through wildlife. They get distributed through people. Uh, basically, you know, we are poisoning an entire planet at the moment, and we're affecting every life form on that planet that has access to those chemicals. That's anything on the surface or in the waters of this planet is now being affected. You can find our, our man-made chemicals on the bottom of the oceans. You know, you can you can find them in the in the snows that fall in the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, polar bears, for example, contain mercury uh, from the burning of coal for coal-fired power stations and things like that. So these, these chemicals are cycling constantly. They don't just go away. It's a cumulative thing. This is the point that people don't seem to understand. They think that once you've sprayed an insect or something, that's the end of the story. It's not. The chemical goes on being active for a very long time. And when it ceases to be active in one form, it takes another form or it combines with another chemical. So you've unleashed a chain of chemical consequences. Uh, let's think for a moment on plastic. I mean, there's been a lot of publicity about the amount of plastic, uh, 8 million tonnes of plastic being added to the world's oceans every single year. And it all breaks down into tiny little particles. But those particles are not just pieces of plastic, they're also vectors, they're taxis for other chemicals. They're carrying those chemicals around the oceans. They're blowing around in the air. We're finding plastic particles in the meconium, that is the first poo that a baby takes when it comes out of its mother's womb is choked with plastic. Then you look at the same baby again six months later after it's been drinking from a plastic bottle and you find again plastic in it. So it's, the plastic is getting through the, the, the mother embryo barrier. It's getting through the blood brain barrier into, into all of our brains. Where the, there've been three reports in the last week uh, reporting blood uh, plastic particles being discovered in human blood. So remember, it's not just the plastic, physical plastic, it's also the poisons that it carries. And this is what I mean about the poisoning of a planet. And it, it isn't just the, the industrial chemicals that we produce, it's also the enormous quantity of soil that we release. Uh, you know, in the mining industry, for example, the mining industry produces about 17 billion tons of, of minerals every single year. But to do that, it has to move 300 billion tons of rock and soil and dirt. And it, 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 that blows around in the air. A lot of it's chemically toxic to people. Uh, it affects their breathing and things like that. It goes into the river where it poisons all the fish. So the, the impact of mining, which has never been properly measured on earth you know, at the moment, is colossal. If we keep on mining, you know, we are going to keep on destroying our environment at this phenomenal rate. So it, it, is, it is the big picture of, of the earth. And this is what I'm saying. This, we know about the carbon pollution causing global warming. What we don't know about is the chemical pollution, which is five times bigger than the carbon pollution and the effect that that is having on absolutely everything. And it's time we woke up because you can't solve a problem unless you understand it. Did I go next? Yes. Yes, okay. So my topic is glyphosate. And the question is whether glyphosate, um, whether there's evidence in the research literature that glyphosate causes uh, neurological damage and neurological diseases. And I would start with Andre's paper that he did with Nancy Swanson. There were charts in there for dementia, autism, and Parkinson's disease, all of which were, had showed strong correlation between those, the rise in those diseases and the rise in glyphosate usage. Now that's just correlation, not causation. Uh, is there a causal mechanism and are there studies? And the answer is yes. 
Um, studies have shown, for example, that glyphosate causes uh, glutamate excitotoxicity in the brain. And so it, it, it affects the NIMDA receptors and causes them to go on fire. And it's the uh, excitotoxicity because the cell is producing too much glutamate that's destroying the neurons. I think there's a much bigger problem with sulfate. And I talk a lot about that in my book. That's really where I started with autism. I recognized autism was a, an issue of mismanagement of sulfate, complete uh, wreckage of the whole sulfate system. And this actually has a consequence in the brain of having deficiency in heparin sulfate in the brain ventricles. That's something I zeroed in on early on with autism. And I really think glyphosate's a major player in that problem by virtue of disrupting multiple enzymes and transporters that are involved with the sulfate system. And it's quite interesting to me that there's a new paper out, I think 2020 on autism, showing specifically that these autistic kids had uh, reduced expression of enzymes called sulfotransferases, which are enzymes that take sulfate and stick it onto various carrier molecules, cholesterol sulfate, vitamin D sulfate, various hormone sulfates, and heparin sulfate. Heparin sulfate is super, super important. And this same uh, article showed in the brain of the uh, uh, autistic kids post-mortem, they looked at the pineal gland and they found the pineal gland had shockingly low expression of heparin sulf sulfotransferase, and they had very low levels of heparin sulfate. And this is a, it has been shown to be connected to autism. Again, uh, post-mortem looking at autistic brains, seeing the low heparin sulfate in the human brains, also in the uh, mouse studies of mouse autism, consistently very low heparin sulfate in the brain. I think it's a specific feature of autism and I think it's caused by glyphosate. But I have a whole chapter in my book on glyphosate and neurological disease, not just autism, but also dementia and Parkinson's and all of these others, and even depression. Ronnie? Yes, my book, Grassroots Rising, A Call to Action on Food Farming and Climate and the Green New Deal. Basically, I'm trying to, to point out that the climate crisis, the health crisis, the environmental crisis, uh, the political crisis, the crisis of, of spirituality and ethics are all interconnected. And if we want to solve the climate crisis, for example, uh, it looks like we will have a reduction of fossil fuel emissions of approximately 50%, you know, down the road sooner or later, hopefully in 10 years. The problem is that a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of 50%, we're still going to climate hell after that. So the question is, how do we get to zero net emissions in 10 years and then go into to net negative emissions after that, where we start to draw down the carbon that used to be in the trees and the soil and the plants and is now in the atmosphere and the ocean. How do we get that back where it can do some good instead of being disruptive? So a big part of the problem is that the climate movement still continues to talk as if we're going to eliminate fossil fuels just by the strength of our rhetoric quick enough to solve the problem. We're not. We're going to still be using fossil fuels 20 years from now, 30 years from now. The point is to be using less of them, you know, and what we can do in the meantime, especially as consumers or farmers or activists, is point out that we can draw down uh, from the atmosphere a lot of the excess carbon dioxide, <clears throat> while the methane converts to carbon dioxide also that's already up there, we can draw down enough and improve our soils, improve our crops, improve our health, improve our treatment of animals, improve the, the rampant poverty uh, in the rural uh, world, which is half of the world's population, uh, if we'll work together. But the food movement, uh, typically has talked more about health than they have talked about, uh, you know, climate stability or environmental health. That needs to stop. The climate movement needs to work in synergy with the food movement. And then we got over here, the natural health movement. You know, we got 100 million people in America who buy supplements or visit alternative practitioners, you know, occasionally or regularly. But do they all buy organic food? No, 
And then we've got 100 million Americans that occasionally or regularly buy organic food. But do they all use holistic medical information, practices, and so on? No. We've got this tremendous division. You know, the, the, the people concerned about immigration reform and immigration justice. I mean, why are people leaving Africa for Europe? Why are people leaving Central America and the Caribbean and Mexico for the US? It's because they can't make a living back in their rural communities, you know? And we have to connect the issues, break down the walls, break down the silos. But as I argue, we also cannot just focus on the negative. We have to point out the positive solutions that we can all start doing today. You know, and we can regenerate uh, our, our food, our soil. We can regenerate our health to some extent. We can get healthier than we were before, not just ward off all the toxins, but it's possible to get uh, healthy. I mean, I'm 75 years old. I have never been to the doctor, you know, except for broken arms, you know, but one thing I've done is eat organic food and and fight the fight, you know? So I don't wake up depressed that we're not gonna win. For some reason, I think we are gonna win, but it is, it is gonna be a grassroots rising globally, not just in one country, the people in Russia, China, Iran, the US, Europe, all the grassroots people feel very similarly that they don't like their governments, they don't like rich people dictating what we do, and they would like to be healthy and happy and for their children and grandchildren to be healthy and happy, you know, and that's our basis for a global rising. And I think uh, I think we're going to see it uh, in the next decade start developing. I was asked about the um, health and safety and regulation of GMOs and also some of the researchers that um, the biotech industry claims have come to incorrect conclusions. Um, to answer that question, I wrote a book, Seeds of Deception, and then I wrote the book, Genetic Roulette, <laughs> and then I created the movie, Secret Ingredients, and, and three other movies, and I'm not going to get to the full answer here. I will say that the scientists at the FDA were very concerned about GMOs. They, their consensus was that they were different and dangerous and needed to be tested. The policy at the FDA says they're no different, not, they're not dangerous and they don't need to be tested. The policy was written by Michael Taylor, Monsanto's former attorney, later Monsanto's vice president, later the US Foods Czar. We have the documents, the memos from the scientists that were ignored by the policymakers. They predicted that there would be problems and they have been. When you look now at the converging lines of evidence, it's like a smoking shotgun. You have the animal feeding studies pointing to certain diseases or their precursors. You have clinical reports and self-reports of people getting those diseases or getting better from those diseases when they switch to non-GMO food. You have the same thing from pets and livestock reported by the pet owners, the farmers, and the veterinarians, certain specific set of diseases related to GMOs, and when the animals are switched to non-GMO, they get better. We have the epidemiological charts showing correlation between GMOs and sickness, as well as Roundup sprayed on GMOs. Thank you, Stephanie and Andre, for that. And we now have the actual modes of action in some cases, particularly with Roundup, because more research is done, Roundup is sprayed on most GMOs. We can see and track which particular mode of action might lead to what particular disease. So there's plenty of evidence, but there's a juggernaut of an industrial disinformation campaign. If we go back to Dr. Arpad Puztai, a beloved researcher who passed away in December, he was given a $3 million grant by the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And in his own research, he discovered that GMOs are inherently 
dangerous. The process itself caused potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers, and testicles, partial atrophy of liver, and damaged immune system in rats in just 10 days. When he went public with his concerns, he was fired from his job after 35 years and silenced with threats of a lawsuit. I asked him in preparation for my book, Seeds of Deception, what was the most shocking moment in the whole affair? I thought I'd lead the book with that. And it wasn't being fired from his job or discovering the health problems with the rats. It was months earlier when he read the actual safety studies used by the biotech industry to get their products approved in the UK. He said it was a turning point in his life. He said, you know what bad science is. You know it was poor science. It was so flimsy, so superficial. And I used his help and others to point out and catch red handed how the biotech industry rigs their research and then broadly proclaims safety based on junk science. Really, absolutely red handed, where they use the wrong detection method, the wrong statistics, the wrong controls, everything. And yet they try to claim the high ground. When Seralini, a French toxicologist, put Monsanto's study that was done for 90 days, he extended that study for two years and discovered multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. And the, and the echo, cha echo chamber of Monsanto's organizations and scientists said, oh, you used the wrong rats. He used the same rats that Monsanto did. You have the wrong size of control group. He used the same size that Monsanto did. And the, the, they landed on saying, well, your control group only had 30% tumors, but your, your experimental group had 80%. In all the other research that we do, the controls have 80%. So if you compared it to our controls, there was no problem. Well, he used organic feed. They all used rat chow and mouse chow. He studied it and found it was all contaminated with GMOs and Roundup. So here's how they, they compare GMOs with non-GMOs. They feed rats, GMOs and Roundup and compare it to rats that are fed GMOs and Roundup. It's a completely rigged game. But their attack was so significant. They paid a lot of money to the editor of the article of the journal where the article was done, and he retracted the study later after being paid $400 an hour as a consultant with completely bizarre reasoning that was attacked immediately by proper independent scientists as being as being uh, inappropriate. So I've been tracking this for years and reporting on it. There's no way that they can come to these many studies show that GMOs are safe because they're not. And we have demonstrated that. We always win the debates. It's right there. It's just a question of now who can get, who has the bigger megaphone? They have more money, but thanks to some of the people here and working on it for decades, 51% of the US population, 48% worldwide, believe GMO foods are not safe. And that is true. So in spite of their billions of dollars and their control over governments, we are winning. And because of that belief among the consumers, many companies are quickly removing GMOs and have for years. So it's a huge success story. And now we have to lock down GMO 2.0. Okay, hey, um, thank you. Uh, Two questions. One, what are the exact steps that consumers can do that would help the most with the exact issues we're speaking about? Chemicals, GMOs, glyphosate, pesticides, the food system, um, the impact it's having on our health and nature. And what are the exact policies you want government to take? So in other words, if somehow um, we got a politician that said, I care what you six say, I will do what you say. I read Julian Cribb's book. I heard Jeffrey Smith speak. I read Ronnie's new book. I read Stephanie's book and Andre's book and Joanna's book. I want to do it, but um, I don't really have time to do the research. So tell me the exact government policy you want me to pass. I'll get it passed. What is it that you want? So what are you exactly, not a theoretical pep talk, what exactly can I and everyone listening do to have the greatest impact on this, our health and the environment, what exactly do you want the government to do? What would be the policies you'd like to see put in place? You could each, each comment on this. Um, you could each comment on this. Sure thing. So just in terms of being a consumer, I would say, 
just do the right thing for yourself. You know, buy things that you know what they are. Sometimes uh, it'll mean investing in something. Sometimes it'll mean just simplifying your life, but really take care of yourself and do the right thing for yourself. And there's a lot at this con that's been discussed at this conference that'll help you do that. Uh, in terms of policy for, for regulators, for government, we really need to focus on getting companies to transition to really becoming sustainable, truly sustainable companies that are producing something that's adding value. And we need clear deadlines. Now, people who go work for the EPA, they do so because they are interested in the science, they're interested in health. They have a lot of skills and uh, they need to put those skills into actually helping companies transition. And there needs to be deadlines. Right now, a lot of those people are spending time um, copying, pasting, they're uh, doing uh, just analysis to keep busy and they're do doing things to basically avoid sticking their necks out. Instead, they need to be out there right with the company with a clear, fast deadline, helping them no nonsense transition and doing whatever it takes. Yeah, I'd like to follow on with what Joanna was saying. And I think the most powerful tool is voting with your wallet and making informed choices. So, you know, actively avoid foods that have pesticides and chemicals. Try to work out how you can stop using plastic, stop using single use plastics and start using natural products. Look at how you can reduce your environmental footprint, your climate change footprint. In other words, be a thoughtful consumer. This is what drives companies to change. This is why things like coal start to become a, a stranded asset. That's why companies now are looking at how they offset their emissions and how they can reduce their emissions. It's government's policy has had a bit of a role, but the truth is the market is the strongest um, deliverer of change. You, you, take away, you take away their customers and their income and they will change. And I know that for when I used to be the international president of the organic sector, we um, did so much change with people going to organic that all the major brands now had to have organic lines so they did not contract. They used to invite me to dinner with them to talk about how they could do it. The consumer dollar is the most effective. And I want to say it's effective with governments because governments, you know, I, I've dealt with governments all around the world and I've got calluses on my head from hitting my head against a brick wall with them. Governments don't lead, they follow. We get industry to change, governments will follow. Yeah, as for uh, the, the personal uh, solutions, eat fresh, eat local, and eat organic. And take that philosophy into everything else that you purchase, right? Everything you buy. When you go to the supermarket and spend a dollar, you are voting for the future that your children and grandchildren will inherit, whether you like it or not. Make that vote something for a habitable earth, not for an uninhabitable slag heap populated only by microbes, which is what we're creating. Every act of consumption has chemical consequences, right? We need to bear that in mind. And we need to teach that to, our, to, our, to, every, to one another um, and to our children. Now, why it's such a big problem, or why it's so difficult. If you put them all together, the coal, the oil, the gas, and the petrochemical industry are worth $7 trillion. They are the third largest economy on earth. So after the US, 17 trillion, after China, 10 trillion, coal, oil and gas and petrochemicals are worth $7 trillion. That means they can buy and sell any government they like, including the US government, including the Australian government, including the British government. And we're seeing them do this now. That They're no longer individual companies. They, they are a, you know, a, 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 an organization. And this all came out of the, the Koch brothers and, and that sort of nonsense, but they, they, they've now allied themselves worldwide. And they control people like Putin. 
uh, you know, who is a petro state, you know, actor. So, you know, they are a very big target. And the answer for dealing with them, I'm afraid, is the one that Andre has said. We have to mobilize the population of the earth because governments are not going to do it for us. They are not going to dare to challenge this vast conglomerate. You know, they, they haven't got the guts and they have already been bought and sold in the marketplace. And when they retire from politics, they all go and sit on the board of one of these corrupt companies. OK, so the only way we can we can address this, I don't believe we can shut these companies down. I think we have to lead them to the safe place where they start to market the things that are safe, the chemicals that are safe, um, the foods that are safe and, and so on. Uh, and we can only drive them there with, with, with their love of the dollar. And that means mobilizing consumers worldwide, all 8 billion of us. So, I mean, everyone has said all kinds of good things and I agree with everything. I just want to reemphasize the importance of organic diet. Uh, certainly when you shop at the supermarket, always look for the certified organic label. Also avoid the processed foods, eat, eat whole foods rather than processed foods and make sure you feed your entire family with these health, healthy, healthy, wholesome foods. Uh, as far as just keeping personally, keeping your family safe and healthy. I think as far as community activity, I, I think that the, I agree that the US government is pretty much hopeless. I've tried and it's extremely frustrating to try to get to the EPA and try to explain to them why they need to do something different. But I think at the local government, people have a better chance to have, be effective. And um, so people can get involved in local politics, make sure that they're not using glyphosate on the schoolyards, make sure they're not using it in public places, for example. And um, you know, canvassing at locally at, with the government, you can have an impact there, much more likely to actually get legislation done, making sure the water's safe, uh, those sorts of things. Um, I, I think that it's good to spend more time in the kitchen. I think we've been trained that we should be, uh, we shouldn't waste time cooking food, you know, and so just go buy the soy protein bar and the potato chips and stuff and just eat really quick and easy, feed your family in a hurry. We need to change that message into really taking more time to cook cook from scratch, you know, and produce um, home cooked meals instead of uh, processed foods. Um, so I think those are maybe my most important points to make. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's four main drivers, <clears throat> as I point out in my book, of degeneration in the world. And there's four main drivers of regeneration. And we gotta get all these drivers uh, in, in synergy at once, if we want to change things. Obviously, consumer awareness and market pressure are one of these. Another one is farmer and landowner and, uh, you know, healer health innovation. We need to point out these best practices because we already have all the solutions we need in every county in every state and every country and every region of the country. The problem is that people don't know about these positive solutions. So that's part of it. Consumer awareness, market demand, uh, farmer and healer innovation. Politics is and policy are a major thing. One thing Americans, I believe, could agree on rural, urban, middle class, working class, no matter what ethnic background is the government needs to stop taking our tax money and funding degenerative practices. Stop subsidizing corporate agribusiness, chemical intensive, fossil fuel intensive. Stop you know, funding uh, medical malpractice and you know, chemical industrial solutions to health that have tried and true uh, solutions. But beyond stopping the subsidy of degeneration and the destruction of the earth. Um, start subsidizing the good stuff, the best practices uh, that are there. And finally, the fourth one, which is the, I believe the elephant in the room is money. There is no way that we're gonna move regenerative practices from being the alternative to the norm without serious money, okay? Right now in the world, there's $125 trillion invested in degenerative financial assets. You know, $125 trillion. We need to start moving 
money from funding degeneration to regeneration. And if we could just move 1% to get things going, $1 trillion into regenerative practices, food farming, land use, health, education, you know, anti-war, uh, we will be in a good place. And I know I've spent my whole activist life demonizing uh, the capitalists and the, and the dictators and so on and so forth, the corporate criminals. But I must say, at this point, I believe 1% of the people engaged in finance and in corporate governance, you know, and the people who hold our our savings and pension funds and so on and so forth. We've got some people on our side, partly because their kids and their grandkids have made them aware and made them ashamed of what they're doing. And we should waste no time, uh, you know, finding that 1% of the economic elite who are ready to work with us because we have the right solutions as we have the money to move forward uh, and scale up the best practices, there'll be a, a landslide of support. Uh, just one, one point that um, there's $20 trillion in the United States in our pension funds. I mean, these are the savings of everyday people for the most part. But why are all the pension funds engaged in investments that are degenerate, you know? Uh, why are all the mutual funds worthless? You know, we've got to take back control over our money, move our money in the banks, take our money out of degeneration and put it into regeneration. And I think we're going to win. And the way history works, uh, I mean, I was lucky enough to participate in some of the near revolutions of the 60s in France, you know, and in the United States. Uh, places like Czechoslovakia, where people all rose up together and we were a global network of radical students. Uh, history doesn't change uh, in an even way. Things build and build and build. And then like the, the wall, the Berlin Wall, it all comes down. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to build and build and build and build. And at some point, there is going to be a global rising. And we've got to prepare ourselves for that and stay healthy and stay alive for that. I know I intend to keep up this battle for at least 20 more years because that's how long it's going to take. So, <laughs> And I'm going to enjoy myself as I go forward because I know the young people, they're looking at us not just about what we say, they're looking at what we do. Uh, and there's an instinctive desire of people to join movements where people are happy and positive and things are fun. So in spite of how grim things are, we got to make this grassroots rising uh, as enjoyable uh, as possible and not ignore the spiritual. I believe there are powers out there that we can tap into that can enable us to overcome obstacles that seem impossible. You know, I don't know whether it's a interplanetary, uh, you know, alliance that we need or what the hell it is. We can't explain it. But I think there is a power that we can tap into that will carry us through. Thanks. I want to give specific uh, needs for our particular first phase <clears throat> of our GMO 2.0 Protect Nature Now campaign. I'd like everyone who wants to participate to go to protectnaturenow.com. When you go to protectnaturenow.com, there is a film, 16 minutes, called Don't Let the Gene Out of the Bottle. That will give you an understanding that protecting the microbiome is critical for our future. The two main goals of our campaign in the present phase are to block any outdoor release of genetically engineered microbes around the world creating laws for that, and to stop the gain of function enhancement of potentially pandemic pathogens indoors. Because if they get outside, they can decimate the human population. And we see these two as very related requirements. 
once you watch the film and understand the un, the reason why and the potential cataclysm that that almost occurred where we might have theoretically lost all terrestrial plant life from one particular genetically engineered microbe or permanently changed weather patterns from another or, or unleashed a pandemic that could have that had a 52 percent death rate when you see these bad actors you realize just how significant it is but you'll also understand about the general importance of the microbiome for human health and environment then go to a on the same top of the page go to the advocacy platform i just checked it it happens to be a broken link right now don't do it today so the, and when you get there there you can enter information and send send to your contact information and all of your elected officials show up and you can in a click and send you can send them whatever campaign we've loaded we've created white papers legislative reports the film uh layperson's articles and we send out tens of thousands actually people send out tens of thousands to their elected officials as well as to their local and regional media which is another opportunity and they also can send it into their social media then go to the donate tab and donate anything that you can afford to do every month, whether it's $5, $10, any amount, so that we can use that to expand our campaign. So watch the movie, go to the advocacy campaign, go to the donate tab. Now, what we want specifically are all of the different groups that whose successes depend on the healthy microbiome to adopt the requirement, the demand that the that genetically engineered microbes be locked down. So regenerative agriculture, when I sent the film to Andre here, he said, it's perfect. It's something that we all want to get behind because regenerative agriculture relies on a healthy microbiome. So we want all regenerative agriculture um, bills to include the insurance policy to block outdoor release of genetically engineered microbes, because if they get out, they can destroy the mechanisms by which regenerative agriculture is a success. We want all environmental conservation bills to have the same lockdown, all ocean conservation bills to have the same lockdown. Invasive species, they need to prevent the release and acceptance of genetically engineered microbes. And all of these should assign harsh liability to those that violate. Human health bills need to include a lockdown on this, as well as the end of potentially pandemic pathogen enhancement. And even national security, in our white papers, we show that the, the Department of Defense, the former National Security Advisors, Homeland Security, they're all very concerned about this new ability to gene edit genomes and said that the technology has far outpaced the regulation. And of course, GMO regulation itself must include a lockdown of genetically, of genetically engineered microbes so they do not escape. So this is the particular focus of our GMO 2.0 campaign right now please go to protectnaturenow.com to participate. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, go to the reaction tab at the bottom of your screen, click the raise hand button and we can call on you. Ivan, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Yes, I am from Mexico and I just want to point out as uh, that Jeffrey just said uh, a few hours ago, that the glyphosate uh, remains in the human body. I understood that uh, for, how, for a long time, but uh, the bone marrow or uh, the skeleton uh, last seven to 11 years to rebuild. So maybe that's the exact time of uh, the cleaning of glyphosate from the body uh, because it's the tissue that lasts for more time to rebuild itself. That's one point. And another is that how can you te test glyphosate uh, while it, uh, it's mixed in the proteins as amino acid? You can uh, measure it when it is liberated from the protein, but when it's united to the protein, how can you measure it? That's all different. And thank you very much for your great effort. I, uh, I knew about the genetic modified uh, organisms uh, for a video that I saw uh, maybe 12 years ago. And since then I have been taking care of me and my loved ones trying to eat only organic food. And God bless you, Jeffrey. God bless you, Dr. Asenev. And God bless you all in this 
uh, great work that you are doing fighting for all the beings in this planet uh, from now on and till the end of times. That's all, Jeffy. Thank you. Um, Ivan, thank you for those kind words. And I want to say that all of us on this panel have been working to improve society and we ha are making a difference. I'm sure that the sensitive people that Joanna, that following Joanna in general, they're learning things. Same with Julian, so everyone. And it's one of the things that to hear this comment from you, we all get this day in and day out when we go to conferences, when we get emails, it's very gratifying. And I wanna say, I'd like to suggest that if people have a desire to help, there is to become an activist or an advocate it is a magnificent opportunity. It is like an advanced technique for personal evolution and it's needed right now. My slogan is think huge, thinking big is so last century. We need huge thinkers because we have huge problems. So don't wait for permission. And uh, as far as the question specifically on glyphosate about whether you can identify it when it's incorporated into the proteins, I'm gonna pass it on to my favorite uh, scientist who knows all about that, <laughs> Dr. Stephanie Seneff, a very close friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both of you for your kind words. And um, uh, it's a great question. It, it, my book actually goes into great detail about what I believe to be this insidious cumulative mechanism of toxicity unique to glyphosate, where it gets into the protein by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. It really very comfortably explains many of the strange diseases that glyphosate is a causal factor in. And I go into great detail in my book about this and the particular proteins that are likely to be susceptible. Uh, Monsanto's own people figured out how to get the glyphosate out of the protein. And this is what's really fascinating. There's a paper, unpublished uh, research commissioned by Monsanto on bluegill sunfish where they, they looked for, they, they, they gave them radio labeled glyphosate. And then they looked for radio label in the tissues and they found it in all the tissues. Then they said, well, let's just measure the glyphosate and see whether the radio label adds up to the amount that you would expect given the glyphosate, that the glyphosate's what's giving them the radio label. And they came up very short. They only got 20% of the label recovered as glyphosate. And then they got the brilliant idea of adding proteinase K, which breaks down proteins into individual amino acids. After they did that, they tested again and they, the yield went up to 70%. And they said perhaps it was incorporated into the protein. These are, this is their words. And this is in the 1980s. And Monsanto absolutely denies that it's, that it, they say it's absolutely impossible for glyphosate to get into proteins by mistake in place of glycine. I believe they're wrong. And I even believe they know they're wrong. And that's why they're not challenging me in my book when I go into great depth about exactly the evidence that's there and the consequences if it's true and how that lines up with all of these diseases that are going up dramatically. So you've got to add something that breaks the protein down into individual amino acids. And I have to say, Zen Honeycutt found glyphosate in breast milk. She, she got breast milk samples from various women who were nursing. And it's, I think some, a third of them tested positive for glyphosate in the breast milk. And the industry very quickly came around with a paper, they published peer reviewed paper on cow's milk and they didn't find any glyphosate in the cow's milk. The first thing they did in their study was to precipitate out the proteins and then they tested the glyphosate and what was left over. So they removed the glyphosate when they removed the protein. Joe, would, you like, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Yes, I'm calling from uh, <clears throat> Long Island, New York. And um, first, I just want to acknowledge the, um, I, I don't even know how to explain how amazing this group of human beings are right now. Um, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm awestruck by this conversation. Um, this is perhaps um, something we all need and, and the education is so critical. And uh, the fact that you speak such truth with eloquence and you back up what you say um, allows the debate to be, be that much more potent. And I, I see a parallel between the fact that we're dealing with uh, 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 this worldwide government problem uh, or, or this worldwide problem with this virus and, and we have all this worldwide governments trying to solve this. And the reality is, is that, you know, we've been dealing with health issues long before this pandemic. 
that governments have ignored. What you guys are talking about is almost identical to what we're hearing scientists talk about with this virus. And, 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 and the whole world stops. And this is something very strange. I don't quite understand it. How come the world hasn't stopped for GMOs? We have been pushed under the rug, marginalized and censored way too long. And I believe, um, I think that the, the pandemic has woken up a lot of people. And I think that um, the timing is right for mobilization. I'm for the first time seeing more people mobilized about health and freedom and things of that nature than I've ever seen before. So I believe our time is now. And, and I'm really hopeful and proud to be on your side and with you people and, and, and the, uh, the, the data and the knowledge, um, it's empowered me. And I, I do my part, um, I, 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 I grow my own food. Uh, I, got, I got good data from Andrew and, and Jeffrey a couple of years ago at the uh, last conference that was a live conference uh, on location about making compost using manure. So I make my own soil. I teach people about composting and soil and, and how to get those microbes to really ignite the soil. So our food becomes dynamic and delicious. So um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm so glad and grateful for all you people and, and this beautiful conference. And I wanna thank Steve. Thank you, everybody. Joseph, thank you, and I really hope that next year we can be back on Long Island again. That would yes. be wonderful. And, and I want to say that when you think about the pandemic, um, one of the things that it's done as a silver lining is it has opened the receptor cells of humanity to the dangers of genetically engineered microbes, not just gain of function, but there's like pandemics for the environment. And so people realize that when you release a GMO microbe, it travels and it mutates. They may not know that it also swaps genes with other microbes. So you release a microbe and all of a sudden it's in a thousand different types of microbes in 10,000 ecosystems, possibly permanently damaging or collapsing those ecosystems, including the ecosystems inside us. But that message has never before been as easy as it is now because of the pandemic. Liz, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? I'm from Hinesville, Georgia. And I've got a question about my home. I don't know if this is the best uh, place to ask, but we have a contract with Terminix and they recently put the Trelona compressed termite bait uh, stations all around the house. Um, to prevent termites from getting into the house. And after listening to so many of you talk about how important it is to protect our planet, I'm wondering what I should do. What would you recommend for a homeowner that has these termite bait stations around their house? Liz, I would say immediately, I, you need to get rid of those. Um, I've interviewed a lot of people with chronic illness and um, those are stories with hindsight, but I would first get rid of it. Um, and there's Google, but there's lots of other options for alternative solutions. The best option, yeah, I fully agree with Joanna, get rid of them. But a very simple option is just to um, get boron, but borax and sugar, or borax and honey, mix it together in warm water put that out as a termite bait and they will eat that and they'll take that back and kill the queen and kill the colony. Boron is a, is a, is a trace element in most soils and particularly in Georgia, where you've got a high rainfall, you'll be deficient in Georgia, in boron in your soils. So you will not be causing an environmental problem and it'll be non-toxic for you and your family. I'd just like to add, um find out what's in the baits. Uh, if, if it's a, an industrial chemical, it could well be dangerous to other things besides termites. Some termite baits these days are natural. Uh, they're based on things like naturally occurring funguses that infect the termite uh, nest and, uh, and destroy it. Uh, and there are physical barriers that can be placed to prevent termites getting into your house. 
So there's a, a lot of options besides using toxic long lasting chemicals. It's, and it's the long lasting, it's the durability of the chemicals uh, that is the real worry because they go on and on and on having an effect on not just termites, but, but everything else, including the inhabitants of the house. Does this work on ants also? The boron and honey? Yeah, cockroaches yes. as well. Great. Um, Sherry, would you like to ask a question? I would, thank you. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to say, I'd like to make two points. Uh, one is a question and the other is just a comment. Um, in terms of the question, I live in central Delaware and there is an uncomfortable amount of poultry farming that goes on around me. Um, and in between the huge chicken house communities, if you will, for lack of a better term, are farm fields that are being grown with GMO uh, crops. They rotate soybeans, wheat, and corn. And these are all feed corn for animals that are going to be killed and slaughtered. Um, I want to believe that even as a small voice in the woods, so to speak, um, <clears throat> with my micro farm, that I can make a difference. However, my observation up to now is that I can be as outspoken and eloquent as I'm given time for, but even if I could convince legislators in this state to make laws, Who's going to enforce them? Who will litigate them? I mean, I, at the risk of sounding vulgar, we can make good laws from now till hell freezes over, but who's going to take the cases to really push the envelope? So that is my question, especially for Jeff Smith, who made the point about some laws being needed, some controls. The comment here, the comment, something I would just like to contribute. Uh, as an idea for anyone who wants to do their own organic gardening farming is to take advantage of the fact that tree services trim and cut down trees and they make wood chips out of everything. And you can have those delivered to your land free of charge. You're actually doing them a favor because that way they don't have to pay a fee to drop those chips. I have had as many as eight bright orange asplund trucks in my front acreage at any one time, dropping chips at the end of the day. And right now I have something like 40 loads of chips and I'm gonna have an orchard out there with no need to add amendments to the soil. All I have to do is be patient and give it two years to compost in. Sherry, your question was, who is going to enforce the laws? Yes. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, I think Ronnie Cummins is going to help them enforce the laws. He's going to sue someone and, and take, some, take some of that uh, recouped money. I think we saw um, over maybe, I think, an estimate of 15 or 16 billion promised, in some cases, spent by Monsanto Bear for the 125,000 plaintiffs that have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, showing that to all of the class action and group tort uh, lawyers, they're all excited about that. Um, if we create laws regarding no release of genetically engineered microbes, we can give it some teeth. We can say, if you release a microbe, you're responsible for 100% of the environmental health and economic damages associated with your microbe. We might even say that you need to have insurance or post a bond. Now, which insurance company is going to allow, uh, is going to uh, allow their client to release a microbe that can travel all around the world and wreak havoc, uh, knowing that they may have to, to carry the burden of that. Uh, what's interesting about the, the laws is that when you release a microbe anywhere, it could end up everywhere. So interlocking various jurisdictions that can track the microbe, find out its source, is one of the ways that we can give this some teeth. 
and the economic prospects of being able to be tracked like uh and identified as the source of that microbe and then having to go and repay pay back the damage and possibly even remediate how do you remediate from the environment it's permanent so and it's long term so you may have to be strapped with money uh, by the government that'll go on year after year after year monitoring and possibly co compensating for damage so you know if they if they complain and say we shouldn't have to do this well we're saying well we should the the taxpayer should cover you um cover your contamination so there may be ways to build in funding for those that sue and building in liability in any case uh and i know uh thank you ronnie for participating in those lawsuits and looking for the gaps in the um in the policies of these companies that are uh, that are exploitable, so that they then follow the law. Yeah, we've got a law in the United States passed in 1989 called the Biological Weapons and Terrorism Act. It passed unanimously in the Congress, and the the penalties for producing knowingly producing uh, weaponized microbes and biological weapons is life in prison. Okay? <laughs> So how come we have hundreds of labs funded by the Pentagon and Big Pharma souping up vaccines and pathogens and so on? Well, it's because they claim, oh, this isn't, we're not making weapons. This is dual use research that has, you know, yeah, maybe it has military implications, but it's for medicine, right? So the, obviously the federal judiciary at this point is not going to enforce that law. <clears throat> But the interesting thing is that we've got several thousand local district attorneys, prosecutors, people like Jim Garrison in New Orleans after the Kennedy assassination, uh, who can be influenced at the grassroots level. We literally have to convince our local prosecutors to call grand juries, you know, and to bring to trial the perpetrators of this type of activity. And if the federal government won't do it, uh, the local prosecutors. We also have uh, 26, well, 3,260 county sheriffs across the US, uh, many of whom are ready to listen to their constituents, especially in rural America, where I live. And if, if they, they will enforce uh, just laws, and not enforce unjust laws. So we got to start thinking that way. We also have police, people in the military, people in fire departments, people in the healthcare industry who are not happy with what's going on. And we need to reach out to unlikely allies as we move forward uh, if we're going to take care of this big problem, this big crisis we have. Sherry, I would just also add that you have to have faith that if you step up and take responsibility for what's within your scope of influence, that other people will as well. You're not going to be alone. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, everyone make a final 30 second summary conclusion, conclusive uh, remark to uh, finalize your, your thoughts. Joanna, you could start. Thank you everybody for sticking with us. And um, you know, I agree with something that was said before that you have to understand the problem and talk about the problem before you can work on the solution. Um, so there we are. Uh, just work on what you can and do what you think is the right stick up for yourself. Speak up for your needs. Um, even if you just did that, you would have profound impacts on this world. Andre? What I want to say is be part of the solution. And that gets back to being the mindful consumer. Think about how you spend your money because that will make the biggest change. If you want to then take activism up to an other levels, you know, we'd love more people to join us and be, you know, activist leaders. And particularly what we'd love to see is the younger generation like Joanna, Jeffrey getting up there and 
even younger people now becoming the leaders because as Ronnie says, you know, we've got decades that we need to work hard to turn this around. And and I really want to support what Julian has said is honestly, if we don't do this, our children and our grandchildren have no future. Julian? Yeah, I just want to emphasize that chemical poisoning is the largest of the 10 catastrophic threats that now face humanity. Um, nothing is being done about it on a global scale. Thing may be being done at a local or national scale, but globally it's it's nowhere. It's not even in the in the headspace of governments all over the world or the United Nations and things like that. So we really need to put this on the agenda, folk. This affects every single human being on earth at the moment. They're being poisoned right as we speak. Their children and grandchildren will be poisoned unless we do something about it. So let's get on and clean up the earth. I wanna thank you, Stephen, for putting this, uh, organizing this event. I really appreciate meeting all these like-minded people who are passionately fighting this cause. Um, I feel like I have to give it every ounce of my being. I, I have, I cry out for the children. I just feel so sad that my generation has left such a wreckage for them to deal with. And I have a lot of hope that those future generations will rise to the occasion and do what they need to do to fix everything we've broken. It makes me very sad that to think what we've done and, but it, there's hope that we can re reverse it. And I think there's tremendous power in regenerative agriculture, you know, as you say, not even to reverse climate change because you can put the carbon back into the soil when you grow healthy foods and help to uh, solve the, th those problems as well, not just our health, not just the soil's health, but also the, the climate. So um, thank you again for doing this. I appreciate it. And, um, and everyone, please do everything you can to make a difference in this heroic undertaking that we're involved in these days. So. <laughs> Thank you. Ronnie? Yeah, well, we had a saying in the 60s that I always loved, which is that there's only one reason for being a revolutionary, and that's because it's the best way to live. You know, and, and when we think of let's live every day like it's our last day on Earth, and uh, I think we'll inspire the younger generation if we do that. Many of us know people that have been diagnosed with a serious disease, and at the end of the day, when they recover, they claim that that was one of the best, most blessed things in their life because they had a chance to reorganize and change. Right now, because of gene editing, we have, the, we have arrived at the inevitable time in human history where we can easily redirect the streams of evolution for all time with a technology prone to side effects so that future generations will not inherit nature as we did, but the products of accident prone laboratory creations. And so we now have an opportunity for that diagnosis to uplift humanity into a new self recognition. Consciousness, in my opinion, is not local or linear. It is a shared thing as well. And we have an opportunity where the solution to this problem is that humanity then redefines itself as a steward and protector of the gene pool for all future generations. And that new relationship, which I think is called for in so many areas, could ultimately be that great blessing. So that as we face potentially existential threats that Julian's talked about, that I've talked about, that others have talked about, it could be the catalyst of that transformation so that we walk away with a new generation, a new civilization, a new way of defining ourselves and respecting and honoring the intelligence of nature and carrying that forward as appropriate stewards, safeguarding biological evolution as we know it for all future generations. I'd like to thank all of you. And if we could unmute everyone so everyone, we could all say thank you together. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you.